Hi, um, in our first Chapter 12 tutorial, we're going to look at using the security market line to help measure investment performance, to figure out if on a risk adjusted basis, if our stock did well, um, better than the market, the overall stock market as measured by the S&P 500, or maybe not quite as well. Was one thing that we're really interested in when it comes to stock returns is figuring out how our return fared once you account for the risk. Because we expect riskier stocks to overall have higher returns and less risky stocks to have lower rates of return. Uh, that comes about because investors need to be compensated for taking more risk. They'll only take on more risk if they can get a greater rate of return. So we're going to look at Whole Foods Market. We're going to compare it to the S&P 500 and I've brought in some data on the risk-free rate, um, which I'm using in my example, a 10-year treasury bill. And my logic for that is that if you're taking on an investment in a stock, you're not doing it with a one-year time horizon, you're doing it with a 10-year time horizon. So let's use the security market line uh, to measure investment performance. And basically, uh, the security market line tells us that a stock's return is going to be equal to its beta multiplied by the S&P 100's return plus or minus some adjustment and that adjustment is going to be its alpha. So the first thing we have to do is calculate this thing over here that is called excess returns. An excess return just means well I could have invested in a risk-free rate but I didn't invest in a risk-free rate I invested in a stock either invested in a company like Whole Foods or invested in a diversified portfolio that would have been the entire S&P 500, a well-diversified portfolio. So how much more of a return did I get for taking on a certain amount of risk? Well, let's take a look. If I invested in Whole Foods in 2013, I would have received a 2.7% return. If I had instead invested in a 10-year T-bill for a risk-free return, I would have received 1.69%. So what that tells me is that I received an excess return of just under 1%. So for taking on the risk of Whole Foods, I earned just about 1% extra. I can drag this down to get my data for Whole Foods for all 10 years. Let's do the same thing for the S&P 500. So if you had invested in an exchange traded fund that tracked the S&P or you had a well diversified portfolio that followed the widest range of stock market, you could have had an 11% return in 2013. Had you taken a safe route, you'd have had 1.69. So that means that you'd have 9.42% excess for taking on the risk of the market. If I drag this down, I now have my excess returns for Whole Foods for each year between 2004 and 2013, and I have my S&P 500 from 2004 to 2013. All right, now let's look at some other data like average, standard deviation, um, those are things that are familiar, and then we'll look at alpha, beta, and R squared. So I can take my average return for Whole Foods over the year. And then what I'm going to do is just drag it all the way across. And there'll be a one column where I won't have any meaningful data. But I'll just delete that out. Let's do the same thing with standard deviation. Standard deviation of my data. Drag it all the way across. I'm going to give it a percentage while it's all nice and highlighted. Give it two decimal places and then I'm going to get rid of that empty row. Okay, so we can see that our average excess return for Whole Foods Market was 15.1%. But in order to get that, we would have had to have a standard deviation of 38.08%. That represents quite a bit of variability. Um, the S&P 500, over that 10-year period, we would have had a 3.7% return which mu with much less variability. So what we want to ask ourselves is, is getting this extra return from Whole Foods 
commensurate with that extra variability that we have. In order to get that, we need to calculate a couple more things. So we've got three statistics, alpha, beta, and r squared, and I encourage you to read about them in the book, but I'm gonna show you how to calculate them. Our alpha is our intercept, it's our y-intercept. And when we, t when we choose intercept, we need to figure out, all right, what's our intercept if we have a certain set of things on the y-axis and a certain set of things on the x-axis. As we know from previous tutorials and from the last chapter, the x-axis is always going to have the S&P 500 on it. So we're going to start with our known y's. Whole Foods is going to go on the y. Then we move on to our known x's and our S&P is going to go on the y. So what we're asking Excel to do is, all right, if we plotted a regression of the line of best fit between these two sets of data, where would this line intercept the y-axis? At 9.13%. Now let's look at beta. Beta is our risk measure. It tells us in a year where the S&P returns 10%, does Whole Foods return more or less? So if it is more variable than the S&P 500, its beta is going to be larger than 1. But if it's less variable than the S&P 500, it's going to be less than 1. So we have a couple of ways to calculate this. It can be known as the slope of our regression line. We're going to start with our known y's. We've got Whole Foods on the y, always, company on the y, S&P on the x. The other way to calculate beta is that it's the covariance of our two stocks divided by the variance of the market. So let's enter it this way. Covariance and covariance is symmetrical, so you can enter either one first. Divided by the variance of the S&P. That's also going to give us the slope of our line, and our beta came out the same when we calculated it. And the last thing is the R squared, which basically tells us what percentage of the variability of one can be predicted by the variability of the other. And so we're going to figure out what percentage of Whole Foods variability can be predicted by movements in the S&P. And we're looking at 0.58 or about 58% of it. All right, let's look at this in a plot. And sometimes that'll help it make a little more sense. I'm going to start by highlighting the excess returns of both Whole Foods and the S&P. And you remember that what that tells us is in comparison to taking on no risk at all, how well would we have done? I'm going to choose a scatter plot, just a marked scatter, and they're going to pop up. So the first thing that I need to do while I'm here is I need to make sure that I have my S&P on my X and Whole Foods on the Y. So what I do is I highlight over a point. I'm just going to choose some extreme point. So series point one, I've got 85.57 on the X and 32 on the Y, right? X first, Y second. Well, I see that that 84.57 over here, here it is on Whole Foods. I've got Whole Foods on the X over here. So I'm going to right click these and I'm going to select my data because what I need to do is switch my axes. So if I select my data, I've got one series of data, and it's series one. Here it is. I'm going to remove it. Look, there goes my chart. I'm going to add another series. It's going to be called series one. That's fine with me. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to say, okay, what do I want on my X? I want the S&P on the X. What do I want on the Y? I want Whole Foods on the Y. If I tell it we're okay, then I can hover over the cell and see that now I'm over 32 and up 84. So I've got Whole Foods on the Y and the S&P on the X. So this is going to be great. I'm going to set up the format that I want and I'm going to call this Regressing Whole Foods Excess Returns on the S&P and then I'm going to give the dates 2004 to 2013. 
And then because that font is so huge, I'm gonna shrink it down just a little. Okay. I'm gonna get rid of this series one. I'm gonna label my Y-axis Whole Foods. I'm gonna label my X-axis S&P 500. Then I'm gonna slide this axis out of the way so we can see it. And I'm gonna click on one of my data points and then I'm gonna right click. And I'm gonna select Add Trend Line. And now I've got my trend line and you may pop up as options or shadow, whatever it is, but you want to be here in options. And you want to display your equation and display your R squared. Tell it OK, and then move this somewhere where you can read it. All right, so what am I looking for? What I'm looking for is my equation. So my y value, otherwise known as whole foods, is going to be equal to 1.61 times my x value, times my S&P value. So it's 1.67 times as volatile. If the S&P returns 10, whole foods will return 16. If the S&P loses 10, whole foods will lose 16, right? It's twice as volatile, plus 0 0.09, otherwise plus 0.9%. And that plus 0.9%. 9.13 percent. I'm sorry, plus 9.13 percent is important because look here, you can see how my trend line intersects the y-axis above the origin. That tells us that when x is equal to zero, y is equal to 9.13. When the market, when the S&P returned zero, Whole Foods returned 9.13. So that tells us that Whole Foods actually outperformed the market on a risk-adjusted basis during that time period between 2004 and 2013. And so what we can say from that is historically Whole Foods performed excellently. R squared tells us though that only about 58% of that variability in Whole Foods can be explained by market returns. So that's you know fairly good for two stocks, but it's not 100%. So we've got a stock that outperformed the market, as indicated by alpha, a stock that is more volatile than the market, um, an aggressive stock, as we would call it, as indicated by beta, and that it is loosely predicted by movements in the market, as told by R squared. So that is how to plot excess returns for a single stock against the S&P 500 over a 10-year time period. Please email, of course, if you have any questions.